This presentation looks at issues related to managing creative people and organizations. We will start with Peter Drucker's view of knowledge organizations and what it takes to manage people in them. This is relevant because creative organizations are a type of knowledge organization. We'll also consider John Hawkins view of creative people. Next, we will consider how a winner-take-all environment drives which creative people wind up becoming most successful. Then we will turn to consider what drives talent value and how their value changes over time. Finally, we will consider how talent are compensated and the role of intermediaries in managing them. Peter Drucker talked about the advent of knowledge workers decades ago. Creative workers are a subset of all knowledge workers. Drucker noted that knowledge workers, and I add creative workers, are not satisfied with doing work that is merely a livelihood. They require that demands be made on them by knowledge, or the need for creativity, rather than bosses in a performance-oriented organization. Importantly, Ideas can come from anywhere, as knowledge and creative work know no hierarchy. Hawkins further defines the characteristics of creative people that rely on their minds. And their job is to dream and imagine. Many of them prefer to work alone, and they must be able to control their work. Creative workers are people whose full-time job is to think and figure out problems, which is why I have Rodin's thinker as the picture here. They use creativity to unlock what is in themselves. And many creative workers live in a post-employment environment or self-employment world where they are permanent freelancers working part-time for one or more companies. Now that we have a little understanding about creative workers, let's look at how some of those people became successful in their field as we consider winner-take-all markets for creative talent. In winner-take-all markets, a very few winners emerge as the leaders. They often earn extremely high rewards while even very good competitors can find it hard to get paid for their work. We see it happen among authors, movie stars, and musicians, who are considered to be those few who are truly bankable in a market. The rewards that these creative producers receive is due to the perception that they are somehow better than their competitors. In such markets, Creative talent can receive support from both large and small customer bases. In some cases, a large number of people are willing to pay slightly more for the top people, as with pop stars. Other times, there are a small number of buyers with very deep pockets who are all seeking the same winner as when there are bidding wars among fine art collectors or professional sports players. Winner-take-all markets are defined by several characteristics. One characteristic is that the top talent in a market can often be reproduced and distributed for relatively low cost using various media. And therefore, moderate talent is not really considered as a substitute for the top creators because the top ones are accessible. Another characteristic is that people who are winners can often be locked in for future success. There are strong feedback effects in the market where people respond to the top creators being available, making those creators even more successful. This is in part because well-known creators have a lower perceived risk compared to unknowns. You know what you're going to get with a known winner. 
From an organizational perspective, there may be pressure to hire people who are recognized name or brand. The intent being that they are taking a lower risk by choosing from familiar options. Finally, a small number of creative winners may emerge because people would rather go with what they know than put in the effort to learn new people. People generally only know a few stars, and they choose their work instead of that from others. At the same time, there may be some variety seekers who help bring new talent to the forefront, and they can in turn become winners. In general, people have a taste for winners. They would like to read or watch what others are reading and watching. So they can engage in social activity related to them, such as discussing books or films or sports, etc. As deep-pocketed buyers propel creative people to the top, markets concentrate and a few people get a disproportionate level of rewards while others get little. Now we will turn to look at organizations and the value of their talent. There are two kinds of talent organizations. Simple organizations revolve around a single artist, like a painter or a singer. Complex organizations have teams of creative people working together to produce an outcome. As with motion pictures, theme parks, and video games. In both cases, individual creators can influence success of their offering. In a given offering, these stars are like product attributes that give the product its distinctive quality and much of its appeal and value. Talent value travels through a life cycle. That first increases and then decreases over time, while their overall value can shift the curve up as it increases over time. Of course, this is just an example curve to describe the concept. No one follows this path exactly. At the same time that value increases, risk, therefore, decreases for the buyers in the market. That is because the creative artist becomes familiar and their likelihood to deliver the goods goes up. Later in the life cycle, risk again increases as the artist's career begins to fade. The time when it is best to invest in a property depends on the market's appetite for risk. While the valuation of an individual, a simple offering, follows a pattern like that we just saw, valuation of complex offerings is, well, more complex. For one thing, it is difficult to gauge the value of an individual when they are among others and they operate as a unit, as with a symphony. These are complex goods where all parts depend on other parts for the entire unit to work. Sometimes these can be very large organizations where each person is very valuable individually. Where the whole value depends on the strength of all members of the group. In these situations it can be hard to establish causality about which people have the greatest impact on the outcome. Finally, let's turn to look at what it takes to manage and reward talent. Talent serves the need of several constituents, fans, their platform, such as their production company, and sponsors, both direct and indirect. It can be a challenge for talent to serve all of these groups, as each may have a different view on what talent should offer. The implication for managers is that they need to help talent to deliver effectively for each of these constituent groups. Talent can receive an array of rewards in various forms for their work. One approach is the fixed fee, where regardless of sales, talent is paid the same amount. This happens when actors work for minimum scale. Another approach is to offer the talent a bonus structure, where they are paid a base amount, 
but they receive bonus awards when sales hit a particular level. This is often the case with record sales reaching silver, gold, platinum, and diamond levels. Finally, there is the revenue share model. Here the talent takes a lower level of payment up front, and then they receive increasing returns as sales increase. This model is usually taken by established stars. Beyond this, some stars even take equity in the production company in exchange for their work, again with the intent of a larger payout after launch. Lastly, we turn to consider the role of intermediaries. Between the talent and their corporate clients, there is often a talent agency. The agent is responsible for brokering deals that are beneficial to their talent clients. Here, individual artists are managed like brands, with agents serving as brand managers, often filtering offers and creating opportunities for their artists. On the one hand, this relationship removes the business management responsibility from the artist, allowing them to focus on their work. It also gives that job to an expert, who can focus attention on the best possible outcomes for their client. On the other hand, the agency relationship requires a great deal of trust in the agent, as historically there have been some who have not always acted in their client's best interests. And of course, there is the cost of the agent, which can be 15% of the artist's gross income. What makes a successful agent or manager includes one who can balance the needs of both the artist and the corporate clients that employ them. In this presentation, we have looked at the concept of the winner-take-all structure of talent markets, looked at how individual talent creates and captures value across their life cycle, discussed how managers develop and manage talent, and found that the biggest winners are a select group of world-class talent with the ability to attract crowds and resources, a small group of whom may capture even larger rewards in the future depending on how they are compensated. And that brings us to the end of this presentation.